Let's say a prayer. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Minister to us, Lord God. Let us be people who worship with our mind, our heart, our strength, all of it, Lord. For your glory, help us to love you, Lord, deeply. Help us to be devoted to you, Lord God. Give us a vision of Christ that holds our view, our focus in everything we go through. As our Savior and Lord, as our King, you are the reality and you are our life. We love you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to look huh, uh, verses 6 through 18. We're going to cover today just a little bit. I could only get through two points last week, and I could only get those, through those two points again this week. Uh, So we will continue in this study, but it's so powerful, so rich, so deep and important that I want to spend some time dealing with the glory of the new covenant, the glory of the new covenant. And so let's read. Paul writes that God, who made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. You know, God is glorified when he carries out justice against the wicked. But he's more glorified with exceeding great glory when a sinner repents and comes to him. So if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even when, even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what was is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded. For until this same day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, transfigured into the same image, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord." I love how Paul, he gets in a little bit of an argument over something, and then he just goes off into theology. I just just love that about him. He's just kind of caught up in whatever uh, theologically he's excited about. But Paul planted the church in Acts, a, a church in Corinth in the book of Acts chapter 18. He planted this church out of nothing. They came out of a pagan religion. First Christians ever in Corinth. He plants this church for a year and a half and then leaves, and it's like clockwork. Um, Judaizers, they're called, would follow him wherever he would plant a church, and then they would try to straighten everybody out. Uh, And these Judaizers, as they were called, were people who believed that Jesus was the Messiah, that he died on the cross, that he's raised from the dead. But they believed that what he did in a redemptive work was kind of icing on the cake of law-keeping. So you had to be circumcised in order to be saved. And at that time, in Jerusalem, the temple had not been destroyed. So they were still doing animal sacrifices, and I'm sure a lot of these uh, Judaizers, they were Pharisees, trying to harmonize what Jesus did with what Moses commanded. And they would say, look, Jesus did a great work, but we've got to keep all these ceremonies. And when you do X, Y, and Z all the way infinitum, 
and you live better than you live bad, then you get a little bit of his forgiveness. And Paul's going to say, no, that's wrong. That we're justified by faith alone in Christ alone, based upon what he did on the cross alone. Paul's going to say there's two ways to heaven. One through the old covenant, which represents every religion on the planet, as far as Paul's concerned. There's two ways to heaven. One through the old, and another through the new. And it's not that religion is necessarily doesn't have truth in it, or philosophies doesn't, don't have good things in it. The problem is you and I aren't good. There was nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments. There was nothing wrong with the old covenant that Moses taught. The problem is with a bunch of people like you and me that can't keep it. How many of you ever lied? How many of you ever got angry at somebody? And Jesus said, if you hate somebody in your heart, it's murder. Do you know that? How many of you ever lusted one time and then never again? How many of you ever stole a candy bar when you're four and done, done right all the rest of your life? Paul says that these Judaizers are ignorant of the righteousness of God. And they go about to establish their own righteousness. And they compare themselves by themselves. Anybody can feel good about themselves looking at somebody less than. But when it comes to your relationship with God, you got to compare yourself to Him. And He's the one that they cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He is rare. He is sacred. He is holy. And if you're going to hang with Him... You do it one of two ways. One way to get to heaven is through good works. And I'm going to tell you there's only one person on this planet that's ever done it. And it's Jesus Christ. He's the only one who hit the bullseye of being righteous enough to be called the son of the living God. And he is our Lord. The second way is through his merits on the cross. He has provided a living way for us to be saved. And that's through the gift of righteousness. Where what he did on the cross was for you and for me. And it is a gift received by faith. I'm going to be thankful that it's a gift. And you don't have to earn it. And Paul's going to say there is a major distinction here between a religion of ceremony where you've got to be baptized and you've got to uh, come to church every week. You've got to give 70% of your money. And you gotta, and you got to do all these things. And on the tail end, maybe a little bit of forgiveness will be given to you. There's a lot of difference between that and thanks be unto God who gave me the victory in Jesus Christ through the shed blood of Christ. Amen? So Paul's going to make a real distinction here. And these guys came from probably Jerusalem with letters validating their ministry. And they said, we have letters. And Paul says, look, the, you guys are the living letters of my ministry. The fact that God raised this church up from nothing in Corinth is a miracle. And it's Holy Spirit fueled. And these boys have a resume. Wonderful. And they're going to invalidate me uh, with letters. He says, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Look to where the Spirit is, and that's where you know God is and His work is. Okay? And he's going to say the letter kills in that he's going to say ink on a page does you no good. This Bible is no good to you if the Holy Spirit isn't working in you, writing it on your heart. Yes. And that only comes through the help of the Holy Spirit through Jesus and the new covenant. The Bible always works in contrast. So he's going to contrast the old covenant with the new covenant today. And I want to go back through that a little bit. First of all, I want to talk about what covenant means. Diatheke in the Greek. What does covenant mean? Dia, thorough. Theke comes from tithemi, means to set in place. A covenant was something that was thoroughly set in place by one person. So in ancient times, it would be like a lease or a mortgage or a, uh, some kind of business agreement. One party would write that out, like a lease agreement or a business agreement. And then the other party would uh, agree to that agreement. And so when it comes to God, He has in the past made covenants with different men. He made one with Noah, promising He would not destroy the earth again with a flood. Y'all remember that? 
He made one with Abraham over in Genesis chapter 15 where he says, go out and look at the stars. And this is going to be your inheritance. I'm going to give you Israel. And, and your offspring is going to be like the stars in the sky. And they're going to bless all the, Gentile, all the Gentiles through this one family. And he makes covenant with Abraham. In the old times, though, they would not just make covenant, but many times they would bring animals to that covenant place and they would kill an animal to show the cost that they were bringing to the table. That this wasn't taken lightly, but it was serious. And it cost to those people, they would slay an animal. And all throughout the Old Testament, there was never covenant established between God and man without a sacrifice. All the way down to the new covenant where Jesus in Luke chapter 22 held the cup at the night that he was betrayed and says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. He initiated the new covenant there on that night as he was going to the cross. And that new covenant was in his blood. I may be thankful today that God didn't send an animal to die for you. But he sent his only son to die to reinforce by his blood that he meant it when he comes in covenant with somebody. It's not only to cover your sins, but to show you what he has put into it. I'm going to be thankful for what he put in. At his cost. It's not at your cost. It's at his cost. It's not your sacrifice that's needed for this salvation. He paid it all. It is sufficient. And it's paid in full. Praise God. Dia Feke for covenant is used for business transactions. It's also used in Hebrews chapter 9. It's used for a will and testament where the testator has to die for the will to be enacted. And Jesus died for you to get all of the goodies. He died for you to have an inheritance. Isn't that something? He, his death initiated your inheritance. Always in blood that God covenants are made. Only this time it was the blood of His Son. Praise God. That's something powerful. Isn't that something? Goodness gracious. God didn't throw this at you and say, we'll see. Man, He... The Bible says over in uh, Ephesians, what is it, chapter 2, that Christ killed the enmity between you and God with the death of the cross. Killed it with His death. Any hard feelings between you and God, He killed it at the cross. That's pretty awesome. So these two covenants Paul is going to talk about today, and he starts with, the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life or quickens to life. Verse 7, but if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be much more glorious? So, talks about the letter killing here. But the Spirit giving life. So the first thing that makes the new covenant glorious is that the old covenant kills. But the new covenant gives life. We covered this a little bit. I want to cover it some more today. It gives life. It's geared toward life. I'm going to be thankful today. The Lord wants you to live and not to die. And He has given you the new covenant. And it's geared toward that. But the old covenant would isolate people from God. Moses is in the presence of Almighty God. Talk to him face to face as with a friend. But when he comes down from Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 34, he's unaware that his face is glowing because he's been in the presence of God. Scares the people. They can't even look at him intently. And a veil was put over his face so he could talk to them. And Paul uses this veil as a representation of the distance and estrangement between those that were listening to Moses and Moses himself, the lawgiver. And he's saying that the law puts distance between you and God, ultimately. Death is a separation from God. Yes, sir. 
And it isolates you from Him. And if the law is the mediator between you and God, how good you're doing. Everybody in this room, the Bible says, is in real trouble. You may think you're a good guy, but it's, it's like putting a little sin and a little bit of sewage in that perfect bottle of wine that you are. Ruins the whole thing. God says, we've got to start over. We've got to start over. Sin ruins everything. The Bible doesn't have a high opinion of people apart from God. It just doesn't. It says the heart's desperately wicked above all things. It says there's none that does good. No, not one. And even if you are doing good and you're patting yourself on the back for it, it's pride. You do bad all week just to do one good thing to show it to everybody like a pearl in your pocket. Look at my pearl. That came from Spurgeon. I like that. I got that from Spurgeon. Little pearl. Pearl. Look at my pearl. You want to see my pearl? The law kills. The law isolates you. The law excites sin. It enslaves men to a performance-based religion where you are loved based upon how well you're doing, not based upon your identity in Christ because of what He has done already for you. How many of you are thankful that your identity is not in how well you're doing today, but where you looked for your salvation, and that's Jesus Christ? Amen? He's going to say that the law turns out a different product than the gospel. And I want to look at that for a moment. Let's look at Galatians chapter 4. And guys, I came to preach today, so I hope you're able to stay because this is, for me, extremely important. Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 through 31, he says, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman and the other by the free. He who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. Which things are symbolic for those, for these are the two covenants, one from Mount Sinai, which gave birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who did not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him, who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what is the... Scripture say, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, it is, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And what he's going to say here is that, y'all know Abraham, he had two sons, right? One was Ishmael and one was Isaac. In Genesis chapter 15, God says, I'm going to give you a great inheritance. But then he goes, Abraham goes home and looks at his barren old wife, Sarah. And says, man, i got to help God out with this thing. And Sarah says, well, hey, we got this slave girl named uh, Hagar. Why don't you have a baby through her? I mean, even though that's not always the smart thing to do in a family. <laughs> and, uh, and so he says, I'm going to help him. Let's do something the natural way. That I can do within my own strength. And so he helps God with his promise in his, in his natural man. And here comes Ishmael. And then the angel of the Lord shows up in Genesis chapter 18 and says, I'm going to, this time next year, uh, Sarah's going to have a baby boy. And Sarah laughs because she hears about it. And the angel of the Lord says, you're laughing? She goes, I didn't laugh. He goes, oh, yes, you did. But you think you're laughing now. Wait till that child comes and you'll name him Isaac, which is laughter. Because I'm going to do something through a barren woman. And she's going to have more seed than that which comes from the flesh. I'm going to visit her by doing a miracle in her that she could not do herself. And Paul says it's an analogy. Hagar represents Sinai, which is where Moses came with the law. But those that come from Jerusalem, Calvary, which is above all, 
are the children of promise, born of the Spirit and not of the flesh. And so Ishmael, while he's growing up, he's, he's circumcised. Isaac circumcised. They both go to the same church. They're both raised in the same house. Only one is a slave and one is a son. Both have some exposure to the presence of their father. But at the end of the day, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for they will not have the inheritance that belongs to the heir. Jesus deals with this over in John chapter 8. He says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Y'all remember that? Yes, sir. Come on, John, work. Jesus says, you will know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And they answered, we're Abraham's descendants. What are you talking about? We have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? And Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if, a son, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. God didn't send an angel to make you an angel. God sent his son to make you a son and a daughter. Somebody who's been a partaker of the divine nature. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's not wanting you to be a goody two-shoes. He's wanting you to rejoice in your salvation and out of gratitude grow in the things of God. But slaves can be in the same house as sons and we go to church and I bet there's some people sometimes that come in saying, boy, I got to do better if God's going to love me. I got to, man, I'm telling you, you're going to be religiously busy for the rest of your life and majorly distracted from the point of the whole thing. And that is Jesus Christ crucified. <laughs> Now we go over into the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 31, 31. Let's read what the new covenant is. What is the new covenant? And Paul's going to borrow from this language in our text. And what Paul's going to say is this. In the Old Testament, in the writings of the Jews, the Jews are pointing to a better covenant to come. In other words, Revelation hasn't stopped yet. There's more to be revealed, and it's in the new covenant with Jesus Christ. But the Judaizers of Paul's day was saying, hey, look, the canon is closed. There's no more scripture. And yet Jesus is a kind of icing on the cake. Paul's going to say, no, everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. And you cannot make sense of animal sacrifices and all of the ceremonies and all of the prophecies and all of the types and shadows of the Old Testament. They're just bits and pieces of religiosity unless they find themselves their meaning in Christ. And Paul's going to say that they were not able to fulfill the law of Moses and so God had to make a new covenant through Jesus Christ and that's to come. So let's read about it. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. And this is the new covenant. God says, as long as it was outward, people broke the law all the time. And so now I'm going to write my law in their mind. How many of you know you're supposed to love the Lord with your mind? That's what we're doing today. We're, we're learning. And with their heart. I'm going to write it on their heart. And I'm going to forgive their iniquity and remember their sins. No more. How many of you like that part too? Isn't that awesome? So what Jesus does is he takes the law 
as your mediator between you and God and replaces it with himself crucified. That's what the New Testament does. It takes the law completely out of the way. The Bible says it was nailed to the cross in Colossians chapter 2. Jesus takes it out of the way, steps in, says that was all about me. All of that pointed to me and the need for a Savior. It's not pointing to you and telling you to be good. It's telling you you can't. Well, choose life that you may live. and This and that. You're terrible. Yes, you should. And yes, you are. And it's all pointing to you need a Savior in every area of the commandments. Points to Him, not to you. Isn't that good news? Praise God. And He's the one who did it, and He's the one that gives it as a gift to us, salvation. Praise the Lord. It's life-giving. It's, it's not help wanted, it's help given. Help wanted is every religion in the world. Come and help us. Got to have some help. Help given is the new covenant. You can't do it. I'm going to do it. I paid for it. And now you are complete. And you are enough. And you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You aren't less than. You are best. You, I put a value on your soul with my blood. And you are bought and paid for, and you are my temple. I don't care what happened to you in your past. This is who you are today. And I'm not saying there's not glory in religiosity. There's some wonderful glory in do-gooding. It's just that the glory of the new covenant is more glorious. Yes, if you're religious, yes. Glory. Good, good for you. Good boy. You get a treat when we get home. Just good dog. Good dog. But now Christ on the cross crucified is much more glorious than you attended Sunday school. Praise God. Amen. When we talk about the glory that excels the glory of the Old Testament, and it excels it because it's more important than it. It's, it's the mean, it's, that was the setup to bring the real substance which is in Christ. When we look at Matthew chapter 17, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on a mountain, a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white like light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared with them, talking with them. And Peter said to Jesus, look, it's good for us to be here. Boy, he always had a problem with his mouth. Most preachers do. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while while he's still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased to hear him. The idea here is that Moses and Elijah represent the old covenant, the law, the prophets, and they turn to Christ who's on fire with glory. And so does Peter, James, and John who represent the apostolic foundation for the church age. And guys, I want to tell you, you may love your pastor, you may love preachers, you may have your favorite one, but if they're not turning you to Christ, and if it's about going to their church and it's about doing religious ceremonies and all of this stuff, everything has to turn to Christ for true meeting to come to your life. It's almost like Christ here sets himself at odds with Moses and Elijah. He's talking to them, but he is the focus, not them. And here are the apostles, and he's talking to them, but he's the focus, not them. It's almost like Christ sets himself at odds with it all and says, it's my show. Great light from heaven Cloud saying, hear him. It's almost like Christ crucified sets himself at odds with your church attendance. Sets himself at odds with your giving. Sets himself at odds with all the works you could ever do. Because he's the one on fire to be worshipped and adored. The glory belongs to him and what he did and him alone. People get all in the weeds with church fathers and this and that and this person and this 
denomination, all that stuff, fine, whatever, but it's at odds with Christ and His glory. When it comes to, there's nothing you can do but receive it as a gift by faith. Amen? That's it! It is the gift not only of salvation, but the gift of righteousness that justifies sinners and gives them the blessedness of David. Is this okay today? Are y'all listening? I don't know if this is good or not. I know you get this just everywhere these days. That's why I don't like a lot of this contemporary business. I don't want to be mean. But I am a little bit. That's all about you. Man, you're secondary. You're the afterglow. It's all about him. Amen. This book was written. There is no Christianity without Christ. He is the centerpiece. And without him, there is no puzzle that makes any sense. It's just convoluted religious busyness. Keeps you distracted and you have no idea what makes any sense, man. That cross is the bullseye right there. And he comes in flesh, and he comes approachable. He's not behind a veil. The, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son, full of grace and truth. The glory of the gospel is that he's approachable. The glory of the gospel is that this God Almighty came down to be personable with you. There is no veil. There is no in-between. It's just you and him. The glory of Christianity is that it's a re- relationship, not a religion. It is personal between you and God. You take him home today. He walks with you. He talks with you. He's personal. But he also glows greater than Moses ever did with a fading glow that came from the outside on, not the inside out. The new covenant glows from the inside out. You can go to a great service to get dazzled, but enlightenment comes through Jesus Christ. He is the one that opens the eyes. He is the one that gives you a vision for your life and a vision of who God is, name and face. He came to give you life, and that life is through a relationship with Him. That is a life. Man, you can have a marriage, you can have kids, you can have a job, you can be busy, but there is no life like knowing the presence of Almighty God for yourself. Your walk with God is your life. And it comes through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. How many of you love Him today? How many of you love Him today? How many of you love Him today? today? Amen. See, we are Christians. We don't just love with our head. We love with our heart because it's our heart that he's after. It's our heart that makes us Christians. And the heart, folks, listen to me. The heart is not your elbow. The heart is not your nose. The heart is your inner man, your inner self. The truest expression of you and your identity is in the heart And that's where, in the New Covenant, God writes His law. He takes out a heart of stone, puts in a heart of flesh. He writes His law on that inner man. How many of you ever tried to compromise with the world and you just couldn't because it's not you? Because that law, that compass, has been written on on tablets of flesh. He takes the law away, puts Himself in its place. Then He takes the law and He writes it on your heart. So that now you believe that there are rules and there are standards and all those things, but you do it out of a heart of compassion and love, not out of a heart of stone and let's kill them, a heart of redemption. And the law is not your master anymore, it's your servant. It's not, you're not made for it, it's made for you. You belong to God. He teaches you good etiquette, but it is not saving. It's only the fruit of that, where your faith is and remains. Secondly, 
Not only is it life-giving, but it's spirit-driven and empowered. Let's look at it. If the ministry of death that isolates and all that business and turns out a slave at the end of the day that has to leave the house, if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadily look at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, what will the ministry of the Spirit not be? How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? So it is the ministry of the Spirit. We are with unveiled face, transformed in the same image of Christ from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of God, Spirit of the Lord. So it's spiritual. It's not fleshly. It's inward by the Spirit. Let's look at Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. I'll just tell you what it says. So God says to the nation of Israel, I poured out, I poured out my fury upon you because of the bloodshed in this country and because of your idol worship. And you wouldn't stop. Everything I did, I pulled out all the stops to warn you and you kept on. So I scattered you among the nations, he says, to the four corners of the known war world. And even there, you profaned my name everywhere you went. You still didn't change. He says, you profane my name, but I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever you went. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. I, and I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. And I will take you from the nations and gather you out of the countries and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. And I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. And I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will keep my judgments and do them. And then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Same terminology for the new covenant. And I will deliver you from all your uncleannesses. How does he do it? Not from the outside in. He reaches in and grabs a heart of stone and pulls it out and puts a heart of flesh in. From the inside out. He says, not for your sake will I do this. He says, after I take the heart of stone out and put the heart of flesh in, verse 31, then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds and you will, that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. But on that day, says the Lord, I will cleanse you from all your iniquities and I will enable you to dwell in the cities and the ruins shall be rebuilt. He says, I got to do it myself. You people won't listen. I'm not going to do it for you, and it's not going to be glory to you. It's going to be glory to me. I'm going to gather you from where I scattered you. I'm going, and then right after that, after that chapter is the dry bones. You remember the dry bones? How many of you know you, these people didn't just have dry hearts? They were dry bones altogether, right? Because it's who they really were. And they're all scattered, and Ezekiel says, he says to Ezekiel, do you think they can live? And Ezekiel says, oh, Lord, you know. As if to say, you looked into the future and saw who would respond positively. No. Oh, Lord, you know as if it's up to you. And he raises dead bones and makes an army out of them. And Paul uses that same terminology in this chapter because he says that the Jewish people who are reading the Old Testament without seeing Christ, they have a veil over their hearts, and their hearts are blind. And the word blind in the Greek is paruo. Listen to me now. Paruo in the Greek. That veil between you and God 
If Christ is not in between you and God as your mediator and it's law keeping, there's a distance between you and God. It's a, it's a veil over your heart and it calcifies. The word paruo in the Greek for blindness in our English is the word petrified. That it causes your heart to become so callous being separated from God. You know what calluses your heart? What your parents did to you. What your siblings did to you. What first grade did to you. What your friends did to you. You know what else callous is your heart? What you did to your parents. What you did to your siblings. What you did to everybody else. And it makes you callous. And going through all the funerals you've been through and everything, it's to put a rock in your chest where you don't feel anything and you're just numb watching CNN. And just all the stuff that makes you hard. Because we're living in a fallen world, not in the presence of Almighty God where there's ultimate healing. And it causes you to be so callous that you don't have any vision for your life anymore. You're blind. And it's that heart that God has to take out of you by His Spirit and put a heart of flesh in its place. And that is a work of God. I'm going to continue. I don't care. I know, I know, I know, and I know. Let's continue. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 11 through 13. He came to his own, his own did not receive him. Can you believe they didn't receive him? All those prophecies about him. It should have been hand and glove. It was so natural. But the natural man's jacked up and they didn't receive him. Can you believe all these Gentiles came in? It's so unnatural. No, it's supernatural. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. What rejection? But as many as received him, to them gave he the right, exousia, authority, to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, why is that verse needed in there? How many of you know whoever believes on the Son of God, he's given you the right to be called children of the living God? Amen? You believe that? But verse 13 says, if you've been saved... And born again, you were not born of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It doesn't matter what your pedigree is. It doesn't matter who your daddy was, who your mama was. When you're born of God, it's not because you were so wonderful before you are born of God. And do you know that it says that your new birth is not of your will? Does it say that? Not of the will of man, but of God. It makes a distinction. Meaning God had to go deeper than your will into the corruption of your heart. It was a heart issue, not a choice issue. Because you can make another choice the next day. Flip-flopper, fish out of water, flipper. How many, of you, how many of you have ever like, how many of you have ever made promises to God that you didn't keep? You're a bunch of liars. I see people coming up, I'll never smoke cigarettes again. I'm like, they're liars. They're good actors. I'm a cynic, you guys. I'm trying so hard. I know the background on all of you. I know all, and I don't even ask for permission to know. I know it all. Just hits my ears, and I'm like, oh, Jesus, I just woke up. I mean, it's usually before my second cup of coffee. Don't you tell me, brother. I know. I know. Some of you I'm yet to know, but I know it's coming. (laughs) What was I talking about? (laughs) Don't you come to church to make all kinds of promises to God in your own strength. You say, by God's grace, and he's helping me, and I'm believing God for the victory. But it's all to God. Don't you dare. What am I trying to say? The real change in a person's life comes from God. It does not come from the flesh. It does not come from, I made a decision. Good for you and your, I mean, maybe you did. But that is not the issue. The issue is the heart. God has to go deep into the heart, not of the will, not of where you came from, not of who your parents were. And he's got to do a work in you that is not of you. And that's why in the next chapter we read that the treasure that we have in earthen vessels, the power is of God and not of us. I'm going to be glad that he bypassed you a little bit in order to do a work in you so he gets all the glory. 
Now, there are some people that believe that verse 12 kind of kicks off verse 13. Whoever received him, to them gave he the right to be sons of God. And then they were born again after they received him. And uh, there are passages over in John chapter 5, I think it's 30, where it says, Jesus said, you would not come to me that you may have life. And so there are people that say, and there's a group, there are different groups in the church. They say, you have to come to him and then you'll have life. And then over in John chapter 20, 21, these things were written that you may believe and believe and you would have eternal life. So they say, you got to come to him in order to have it. You got to believe on him in order to have the eternal life. And then there's another group in the church that says that verse 13 is not the result of receiving him, but 13 is the underpinnings of the whole conversion. That it's like looking at a pocket watch and you see the hands on the watch, the surface, but if you open up the watch, you see the gears turning on the inside. And here are the gears that this whole thing was God that you came to him. And there's a little bit of a debate. Whosoever will, no respect to persons, you know, God's just waiting, can't do a thing about it, but stroke, kind of rub your shoulders and get you kind of in the right direction. And, he, and, he, and he, he's really trying. God, stop, John, be nice. But he kind of, and then you receive him, you plug your plug into the wall and the light comes on, okay? And that's where they are. This other group says, ask the question, how are you lovingly trusting in God with a heart of stone? And then he takes the heart of stone out of you and puts the heart of flesh in? The other group says that it is as much a work of God to pull the heart of stone out of you as it is to put the heart of flesh in you. And that is why they would say, Jesus said in John 6, 37, no man can come to me. No, I'm sorry. All that the Father gives to me shall come to me. And he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Even the coming is a gift from God. You go over to John chapter 6, 65. No man can come to me except to be given him by the Father. The Spirit gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Even when we were dead, He made us alive, Ephesians 2.5. And so there's groups on both sides in the church that said, I, did, I chose, I made the decision, I received. Then God took that heart of stone out of me, put the heart of flesh in me. And then there's another group that says, they, distinct, they, they make distinction between being born of God and the new creation, okay? How many of you know that I was only born once? I wasn't born every day. I was born in 1974, okay? And now I'm alive because I was born. So born of God is the gestation period. It's the preparation period. It's all that went into the birth, and then the life came from it, like a baby crying faith and repentance needing the mother's milk of salvation. That born of God is a work of God that is solely God as much as being born the first time. And some people say that comes after you've turned and received. And some people say the whole thing describes conversion and a changing of mind. Okay? Those are the two different views. There are two different camps in the body of Christ. They narrow down to those two things. Where do I lean? I just I have a real hard time separating faith and repentance from God doing the work in my inner self of pulling the heart out, putting the heart in. Okay? That's me. But where we come together as a church is we say the new birth is where the real change happens. 
And there is no real change apart from the work of God by His Spirit in us. And we also believe that we are justified by faith alone in Christ alone. And that's where we come together. But all that to say, the Spirit goes where He listeth, and such are they that are born of the Spirit. That which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. And you can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born of the Spirit. Let me ask you one more question as I'm finishing with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to get into it. Verse 5 says, He who called the light to shine out of the darkness hath shone in our hearts that we might behold the face of Christ. Let me ask you, who turned the light bulb on in your heart? Who turned the light on? Who flipped the switch in your heart? Anybody know? Was it you? Not in your brain. In your heart. Who turned the light on? Do you remember when you got saved? Do you remember how you had a supernatural hunger for God that you never had before? Where did that come from? Man, when I got saved, it was like God punched me in the gut and I was like, <gasps> and here comes the Holy Ghost. And that's pretty much it. He took his finger out and with the finger of God, he cast out the strong man and spoiled all of his goods. Y'all happy today? I don't know if everybody's going to be mad at me or not. I'm just kind of having a good time today, having, a, having a, little, a little party up here. I get up here and swing as hard as I can. I never know where that ball is going. Oh, let me preach some more. You know what comes with a new birth? Five things, real quick. Number one, he that is born of God, he that has been past, passive, past passive tense. He that has been born of God. Practices righteousness. That's 1 John 2.29. He that has born, been born of God cannot continue in sin. 1 John 3.9. Because his seed remains in him. Cannot. That's the second thing. Third thing. He that is born of God loves his neighbor. How many of you know if you're saved you have to love people? And God has put a heart in you to do it. How many of you have loved people even when you didn't want to? How many of you said, I'm done, I'm quitting, but there was a fire shut up in your bones? He pulled your heart right out for somebody when you were done. How many of you ever had that happen? Because it was God's love in you. Fourthly, he that has been perfect passive tense, born of God, 1 John 5, 1, believes, present tense, in the Son. And then fifthly, he that has been born of God, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, overcomes the world. Yes, yes. Those are the five things assigned to the new birth in 1 John. You have to... It's inevitable because it happened to you passively. Your active verbs have to do with His work in you. He wrote His law in your heart. It's not coming from outward. Know the Lord. It's inward. Shining. It's not fading. It's going from glory to glory as by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. These are not, wouldn't you like to do some more good stuff because you once were born again. <laughs> That's not how it reads. John doesn't dabble in fiction. He dabbles in truth. Yes. Yes. It is inevitable because it has nothing to do with you that you practice righteousness because of the work of God in you. John, do you really believe that? Absolutely. Glory to God alone. I am his new creation. I am his workmanship. I am his building. I am his field. I am his fragrance. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. My very identity has to do with the heart he put in me. Amen. That being said, I'm... A jar of clay up to my armpits. I get in trouble all the time. And God keeps pulling me out. But the power is not of me. I'm spirit empowered. And as by the spirit by which I have been born, I am not of this world. 
And God has given me a joy that the world can't take away. Amen. And he is building his house. And he is the one that gives the increase. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus. Now we'll get into the other ones next week. We're talking about justification. I'm just going to preach some more on that. We're going to talk about how the new covenant's permanent, where the old covenant passed away because it was full of sinners. We're going to talk about how it gives hope, how it gives vision, and how it gives freedom. And when I get to vision, that's my favorite one. I've been waiting forever to get to it. But that's the, oh, it's so good, man. Let's all stand today. How many of you are glad today that Christ is in you, the hope of glory? How many of you are glad that he is shining from the inside out just fine? How many of you know that he's going to do it? And maybe you're at a little place of glory. You're going to go to another place as you behold him. And that's why I'm preaching this today because you say, well, what's the practical application? There is none. Just keep looking at Christ and you're going to get better. Amen. Amen. Let's just keep talking about this stuff and we're getting better the whole time. Glory to God. How many of you are thankful that he has your eyes? Lord Jesus, today we thank you today for your hand on our church and on these precious people's lives. But Lord, if there is one person in this place that does not know you and is isolated by their own sin and they, have, and they are enslaved by it, it's cat and mouse with their whole life. And they can't make heads or tails of this life. And they need you, Lord Jesus, to be the substance, the one that brings it together and heals their mind. Father, I pray today if there's anybody, that, maybe you, Lord, you've been preparing hearts. I pray today that today be the day they come to faith and they be saved and they leave this place not solitary, never alone. This world is a lonely place, but not with you. You heal hearts. You heal rocks in our chest. And you give us back our humanity. Truly in you, loved by you. If there's anybody here that does not know you today, Lord, personally, intimately, this is the glory of Jesus Christ that he's here right now with us. And if there's anybody here that doesn't know him today, would you lift your hand and just say, I want to be saved today. I want to know Jesus Christ as my Savior. Lift up your hand right now. Let me see it. Anybody in this room? I see you, brother. Anyone else today just says, I want to know that I'm a miracle and not a tragedy. And I want to put my faith in Jesus Christ to continue to save me from the inside out. Lord, I just pray that I see you. I love you, bro. I love you. Pastor, right over your shoulder, man. You grab a hold of him today. Jesus, I thank you today for saving my friends. Save all of us. Put us in the same house. And let us abide with you forever with everlasting life attached to our salvation. I ask it in Jesus' name. Now, one more prayer. How many of you just say, Jesus, today you're enough. You're my enough. Everybody say, you're my enough. Just say it to him one more time. You're my enough. We love you, Lord. We love you. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us. Thank you, Lord God, for your faithfulness to our homes and our families and our children and our grandchildren. Thank you, Lord God, for never leaving or forsaking. Thank you for being the one that sticks closer than a brother. We love you today, Lord, for saving us from our sins. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a praise in this house. If you can stay for food today, please. We have so much food that we prepared, and I'd hate it to go to waste. So please come and eat with us. We love you today. I'm going to go over there in a second as well. God bless you today. Amen.